We have the privilege of having South Carolina's top doc on the coronavirus response from the governor's office. We have with us uh, coming up in just a few seconds, we'll have Dr. Bell on with us to talk about some of the important issues that we face as a state and as a nation. She'll focus, of course, here in South Carolina as she has been leading the charge. Uh, she's with us now. But I look forward to hearing what she has to say as it relates to what's happening in South Carolina uh, on the coronavirus. But more importantly, uh, good morning. Good morning, Senator Scott. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm well, thank you very much. I'm practicing social distancing as much as conceivably possible. Uh, I, had, <laughs> thank you. I, had a, I had a big event yesterday. Uh, we had a 500 person auditorium and I had 19 people there. So we That's would be able to space them out. That is so, great to hear. I'm trying to follow your protocols because I realize that if we do what you tell us to do, our state will be healthier. Um, and we'll have the chance for, I know there are a lot of things that are important in this life. Kids going back to school, incredibly important. Having uh, you know, chances to go shopping, mediocre of importance to me. College football, really important to me. So if we want to see a chance for us to see our kids playing college football and seeing state football, wearing a mask as I have been talking about on my social media platforms, incredibly important for all of us to follow every single social protocol so that we save lives, that we don't share what we have and that we protect ourselves as much as possible. And so thank you, Dr. Bell, you have been the leading voice in our state as it relates to the coronavirus and the healthcare impl implications. So thank you for your hard work, your dedication. And I'm glad to see that you're smiling and you're doing well. Let, let me just jump right into it if you don't mind, Dr. Bell. Of course. Going back to school, there's a lot of questions about school starting, what should we expect, where are we, how can we help? I think wearing masks, I've had a, I'm, I'm in the middle of a 30 day challenge asking South Carolinians and people around the nation to wear a mask whenever in public. Can, can you just talk about A, the importance of that and B, how that translates into getting kids back in school, which we, we know that's important for them and we know it's important for all of us. Well, uh, thank you, Senator, for presenting it that way because that one tool is critically important. Uh, and, and as I am asked about uh, going back to school and when I think this is really only six weeks from now when we would normally go back to school, mid-August, we only have about six weeks. Uh, but when we look a bit in the past, where we were six weeks ago in terms of our disease activity here in South Carolina, we were actually in a much better position. Memorial Day weekend was really about six weeks ago, and that's when our disease rates began to, um, to skyrocket. So if we want our kids to go back to school and be in, a, in the safest possible environment, if we look at where our curve was six weeks ago and where we want to be six weeks from now to make that as safe as possible, um, we're going to have to make some dramatic changes in terms of what you just mentioned, the, the widespread use of masks. We have limited tools, but that one thing, well, so there's two things, the, the, um, the adoption of masks whenever in public and physical distancing. And if we um, are not able to do that uh, significantly differently than we're doing now, then it's going to be a greater challenge for our kids to go back to school having um, disease activity much, much lower. So we can absolutely turn this around. And I, I really appreciate that mask challenge because um, there's abundant evidence that it works. And, and if we do that, we can really be looking at a different situation in our community six weeks from now. And I talk about going back to school as if it's a panacea for life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. It is not. But one of the things that's really important for us as a society is we have these landmarks in our future. And I'm a, I'm a goal-oriented person. I'm motivated by knowing that I can make a difference somehow, some way, for someone. And so I start with schools because it's the clearest landmark that we have as a nation and as a state. And so the more we focus on the motivating factors in our lives, perhaps the more likely we are to embrace the common sense protocols that lead to healthier outcomes. Kids going back to school in and of itself isn't the, 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 the highest goal. 
The highest goal is to save as many lives as possible. But the clearest indication that we're moving in that direction from my perspective is having kids going back to school because that tells me that we are all adhering to the social protocols and the mask wearing and we're flattening the curve and we're mitigating the spread, which means we're saving lives because we have these strong public indicators that what we're doing is actually working. And I think that's really important. Yes, we're, we would be saving lives in the short term, but the importance of the education in the long term in terms of saving lives uh, should not be underestimated. There, you know, many of us in public health are worried that if we don't get kids back in school, that uh, we could lose a generation of children who have lost that foundation in early education. And it is education that translates into the long-term benefits of health, uh, being well-educated translates into uh, reduced chronic conditions. Uh, those chronic conditions are contributing to uh, COVID-19 now with those more comorbidities. So it shouldn't just be our short-term marker of, of getting people back to school, how we're doing now. But it, I'd also like people to consider that, um, you know, there are some essential things. Education is essential. There are certain recreational things that are happening now that if we could avoid those and make those sacrifices now, uh, for social distancing and avoiding certain uh, group activities with the with the community goal and the the goal of being socially conscious that those are things that we can do now and in the next few weeks to allow for an education not just for primary education but higher ed too Absolutely. Um, all of these activities that we want to see to come back to normalcy um, we have those few basic tools that I that I keep reiterating a, these are uh, sacrifices, but they're um, minimal sacrifices if we consider, would you put on a mask to save someone's life? Yes, that's awesome. I say, I say this because I, I struggled with this as a kid. When I was a kid, I wanted everything right now. Uh, and one of the lessons of life is delayed gratification oftentimes produces the best results. And what you're talking about is having the discipline to say no to some casual uh, enjoyment today in order to say yes to a long-term, vibrant, healthy uh, country and state where we get to say yes tomorrow because we made the small, simple sacrifices today. Because wearing a mask, it's not hard to do. They're not hard to find. It's not an expense. There's, there's not a shortage of masks. It is simply a choice that we can make every single day to say yes to our health, but more importantly sometimes to the health of the loved ones that we have in our lives. I know that one of the things I keep harping, harping on because my mother's uh, mid 70s, I won't give her age this time. She told me to stop doing that, so I'll stop. Uh, she's mid 70s and she's still working and she loves work, but she's also very vigilant in mask wearing. And when I think about that mid 70 population and higher, I think about the strategy that we've undertaken as a state around nursing homes, elderly care facilities, to hopefully mitigate the spread of the, the virus in those places to flatten that debt, the mortality rate there. Can you talk about some of the goals that we set? I think it was 40,000 tests in June and July, or May and June, I think it was, in order to be aware of what's happening in the most vulnerable places in our state as it relates to the virus, that's, that's it. That's nursing homes and elderly care facilities. Yes, well, we had uh, 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 several goals for statewide. We had a goal of testing 110,000 people per month, uh, but specific to the nursing homes, we set a goal to test every resident and every worker in all 194 acute care facilities in the state. And, and that was conducted. But uh, we recognize that that is an ongoing threat um, because nursing homes uh, are, are where care is provided for vulnerable populations, but they're also essentially residential facilities. So they're facilities where uh, under normal circumstances, it's very important for those individuals to share meals, to share activities, to share living space because socialization is important for them. But um, when you have the risk of a, an infectious disease being transmitted, especially one that's that is a respiratory disease, 
then those normal practices in nursing homes make it um, much more difficult. And the staff that work in those nursing homes are not as familiar with the use of personal protective equipment as our staff in um, a, a, a more acute care facility like a hospital. So this is why they're vulnerable. The, the individuals and the staff members in those settings, they're not as um, experienced with using protective equipment and preventing disease spread. So what we've done in those facilities is to make sure that they have um, that all these facilities have access to resources that we call infection prevention and control and uh, to more widely test so that we can identify where pockets of transmission are occurring and then we can do disease interventions not just in awesome. those facilities but in community settings where we identify clusters so the the disease response activity is very important but going back to the prevention measure and the use of masks, I just wanted to uh, mention, um, you know, there are many questions about what high tech advances we have, medicines, vaccines, but the masks is really low tech, widely available, has nothing to do with access to care. You don't have to go to a doctor, anybody can get a mask. And, and it, is, it is so effective and available to everyone and is really, we can dramatically make our disease uh, trends come down. So our, our younger population who are our highest uh, group now, the activities that they're participating in without using masks or physical distancing is continuing to affect those in the nursing homes that you mentioned, resulting in more hospitalizations and more deaths. So um, we can get there much quicker with the use of masks. You mentioned this, uh, this I guess the, the mask is a, a bit of an inconvenience, but not that much. But we can reach a, a place much more quickly where we're not having to struggle with um, this very, very high disease burden at this time, and, and we can get there sooner. Absolutely. Well, it seems to me that uh, when we look at the numbers that were coming out of nursing homes in May, we, I think it was around 40, 41% of the deaths in South Carolina came from the nursing home communities. Uh, and I think that number is about right. And I think as we understand how the young infected who may be asymptomatic, who have loved ones that are in nursing facilities and or grandparents that they visit, that even though you yourself may be asymptomatic, the ability to spread that virus and impact your loved ones is critical. And that's why when you, when you were going through uh, when folks at the nursing homes or at facilities are having meals together and gathering together, that's a very vulnerable time. Well, younger folks are doing that without actually thinking about it, which ultimately means that you have the ability to spread very quickly among a younger population that then has contact with uh, people that are a little older or generations older, and that compromises the health of an entire society very quickly. Yes, and, and uh, that's an important point. We, when we mentioned the, the normal setting of nursing homes, allowing those shared meals and shared activities, and to their benefit uh, now, actually many of those activities are, are very, Gone. very restricted. So there's a lot yes. of isolation among these older individuals in these homes now when other people are out in the community and sort of enjoying these recreational activities and not being socially responsible uh, um, and understanding or accepting how it's affecting others. And in fact, now that uh, with the reopenings, um, the, the risk of exposure and the risk of transmission is far, far greater now um, than before the reopenings. The, the idea was that <clears throat> we would reopen not to resume business as usual, but there would be reopenings with continued restrictions continued physical distancing and the use of masks. So when we moved in the direction, many people moved in the direction of the reopenings, but with business as usual, we are now amplifying the risk of exposure. If we, if we think back, and this is completely out of a hat, these are not real numbers, but if we consider that uh, earlier in uh, April or May, your risk of being exposed in the general population, say, might have been one in a thousand. Well, now if it's one in a hundred, and if you're in a crowded bar or something like that with a hundred other people, then you're not physically distanced and you're not wearing a mask. Not only are you likely to be exposed, but so are the hundred other people there. So we are just amplifying and driving this as um, those recommended practices 
are not being observed and not being adopted. So it, it is getting, um, everyone can look at our curves and we can see that it's getting worse and worse and we, um, we're going in the wrong direction, but we can absolutely turn that around. And we better, we need to. I, I implore all the folks listening to pay close attention because this is something that for the most part, we can significantly prevent the spread of the virus by doing some of the things that we're talking about. It may sound like we're being redundant or, or saying it over and over again. I, I say it over and over again to amplify the importance of simple suggestions that can save lives. I have a friend of mine right now, uh, a young man, late 40s, early 50s, who's been on a ventilator for the last three weeks because of this virus. And so often we think that this is not real. It's, it's not that serious. Well, for younger people under the age of 18 or 25, maybe, uh, they seem to be able to handle the virus in a different fashion. But when you take that and you spread it throughout a community of people of all ages, you get a very different response. And frankly, you never know who's going to have which, you know, what response. So to be responsible is a very important key. And I will say without any question, having friends and loved ones who have the virus, it's critically important for us to do what is necessary to slow the spread of this virus. I implore you to join the team and do those things that are so important that will prevent the spread of the virus. Thank you for saying yes to what we know is common sense. I, I like to talk about going back to school or football season coming because those are things that we all know about and think about and, and hope for. And we can make those hopes become a reality by the way that we respond right now. You can't wait until the day before school starts to say, oh, I need to do something. I need to get serious about this. No, that's not the way it works. What we are doing right now is how we make the biggest difference. And to that end, Dr. Bell, <clears throat> The, the question about hospital capacity keeps coming up. And as we think about the spread of the virus and how that puts more pressure on our healthcare system, can you talk for just a, uh, a few minutes about uh, where we are from a hospitalization perspective and capacity? Well, we're, we're monitoring that very carefully. And, and currently the um, hospital capacity is at about 75%, I believe. And so um, this is um, it's, it's being monitored carefully, but this is another area where we have to plan in advance because you know early in the epidemic, we all remember where elective procedures had to be canceled so that we made sure that beds were available uh, to anticipate this surge of cases. And we're in a situation now where um, that, that is sort of eking up a little bit, the trends in hospitalizations. It was, there was a lot of attention paid to the fact that, well, uh, the disease curve in general is going up very steeply, but hospitalizations not so much. And now it's worrisome that that is creeping up. And uh, ICU bed use and the availability of ventilators is a continued concern. But in addition to that, the healthcare workers at the front line have to absorb that capacity. These are not just beds, but we have to have skilled workers who can staff those beds. And as those uh, cases increase, not just here in South Carolina, but nationally, we think about the personal protective equipment. Those are shared resources nationwide. So as more people go into the hospital, we will exhaust that personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. and. Um, and that's beginning to be a concern now. There, there are limitations in the availability of personal protective equipment in some settings. We have to pay careful attention to that in um, nursing homes in particular. But one of the worries is that um, we're in the fall, moving into the winter, and that is flu season. So if we think back on the fact that prior to COVID-19, in flu season alone, we were exhausting our hospital capacity. We had temporary care sites set up in the parking lots of some of our hospitals in the state to deal with people who had the flu alone. If we um, layer COVID-19 on top of flu as we move into the fall, this is just another thing that we have to anticipate and plan for and is a reason for us to adopt every possible prevention measure now so that we do not max out our hospital capacity. And, and I would mention that um, I, I believe there are approximately 1,500 people 
in hospitals in South Carolina right now with COVID-19. And uh, Senator, you mentioned your friend who's on a ventilator. Um, I often get asked the question about this curve, is it too late? Well, you know, I would very unfortunately ask people to think about the fact that there are some of those people in the hospital now who may be in an ICU bed or who may be in a ventilator who it actually ultimately will be too late for. So can we please pay attention to the number of people who are in the population now who it's not too late for? There's so much more that we can do to prevent these hospitalizations and additional deaths if we take dramatic measures now and, um, and not ask ourselves, you know, what could we have done differently? Who is it too yes. late for and it's not too late? So hospital capacity is a very important thing to pay attention to immediately. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bell. I have one, my, my party question, I know the numbers within the minority communities in South Carolina have improved some, I hear. Uh, will you talk about the importance just uh, from a demographic perspective? We know that African Americans seem to have more of the morbidities that make the uh, virus uh, a stronger impact in certain communities. Uh, I hear the numbers are getting better. Will you just give us perhaps a snapshot of where we are on that as we, we close out this Instagram Live? Well, we, um, we still need to watch that very carefully because it's, it's not necessarily that that, that that has improved in African Americans. It's just that the proportion of the, uh, of the tests that have been performed, it's sort of been diluted out because there are far more younger white people who have been uh, tested now so that it makes the proportion of African Americans look uh, better. But that, that is a kind of factor of, about the sampling. So there are those chronic uh, health inequities that African Americans experience due to um, uh, a, a higher likelihood that their chronic medical conditions are, are poorly controlled or, or more so because of limited access to care. So we do have a great deal more to do, but we, we have made great inroads in, ter in terms of making testing available in um, underserved communities that we identified. When it became evident that there was a disproportionate impact on African Americans, we responded. We made testing available in pop-up and mobile sites, but also have increased the testing capacity in medical homes that is really important for those underserved communities so that they cannot just be tested now, but that their chronic conditions can be well cared for and that the quality of their lives in the long term will be improved. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bell. And the good news is, uh, we have another special guest. We have the commissioner of the FDA joining us today. It's exciting news that we'll have a chance to talk about a lot of the topics that are important to us within the COVID-19 uh, footprint, but also some, some other important topics about immuni immunization uh, overall, frankly. It's another topic that we'll talk about today, but I'm looking forward to uh, Commissioner, join us in just a few minutes. Dr. Hahn has uh, really been things with him, a sense of optimism and energy that's going to be very helpful for us to continue to combat the virus. And, uh, uh, he and I share the same barber, which is wonderful <laughs> for me. So, so yes, often we do. Yeah, you have all these people, Dr. Han, that have these heads that must be covered by hair. It's like they've just <laughs> messed up in life and God did not give them the amazing blessing of good Good, good looking head. So it, well, thank you hair. for saying that. You certainly have a good looking head, Senator Scott, for sure. And it's so much easier without hair, for sure. It really is. I, 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 my, my, my blow dryer is broken for the last 30 <laughs> years or so. Uh, I, can, uh, I can always find something to, that's shining and reflecting off the head if necessary. There's so many good uses for bald heads that people don't necessarily think about. Agreed. Well, let me tell you, not only do you have a great looking head, but you also have an amazing brain inside that cranial cavity. And I just wanna say on behalf of America, thank you so much for your willingness to, to serve our nation. And no one knew when you started that you would be one of the leading voices on a global pandemic. We are all blessed by people like yourself, public servants who have the expertise, the intellectual curiosity to make a difference and then bring those resources to the forefront for the American family. So thank you first and foremost for being an amazing person and being willing to serve. Senator Scott, thank you so much for that. Um, it is an incredible honor to serve the American people. Um, and I just wanna start off by saying it, it, the partnership with you, your leadership for this country um, is just remarkable. 
Um, I can tell you my whole family are huge fans of yours. Thank and you. um, I, I just want to thank you for what you do. And it is such an honor to be here with you today. And I hope I don't mess up and that you invite me back. <laughs> well, we're going to invite you back. As a matter of fact, we might even invite you and your family to move to South Carolina. I like people like you guys. I well, we, to... we actually, we have, we have a place in Pauly's Island. We're, we have family there. So we love South Carolina. I My thought best. I saw you on a plane. So I, I thought I saw you landing That's in right. Charleston. We were yep, together. You so bet. It's good to see you here. Now listen, I'll just jump right into it. I want to you use bet. your time wisely because I know you have plenty to do. You know, COVID-19 has consumed so much of the conversation that sometimes there are a few other topics that are really important. And one of those topics, I want to start off there, is the topic of immunization, immunization for our youngsters and the importance of routine uh, immunizations. I'm not sure why I can't say that word anymore, but uh, getting your kids immunized, immunized. So will you just talk for a minute or two about the importance, not just about what's coming, but the importance of routine immunizations uh, that need to happen? Certainly, Senator. Um, this is a really important public health topic. Um, we know from very, very good scientific data, lots of clinical uh, studies, that vaccines save lives, that vaccines protect our youth, they protect our elderly, and that they're really important and very, very, by the way, cost-effective measure to, to prevent disease. Um, and we have to do a better job as public health officials to stress the fact that they are safe. The parents can trust this, that um, the vaccines have been gone through, have gone through vigorous testing and that your FDA, America's FDA, has looked at the safety and effectiveness of the vaccines and that you can depend upon that. Um, it, we, 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 we need to do more of that. We need to message that. And I know it's been an, an issue during COVID because we haven't wanted to go out and see our doctors. Now yeah. that we have, are opening up, we really have to get back on schedule with, with that. And our doctors are doing a great job of providing the environment where these can be given safely. Well, that's great news because I think so, so many parents, I, I've heard from friends and, 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 and people have kids, they're really worried about whether they should get their kids vaccinated or whether they shouldn't, the timing of it, should they delay it? What happens if there's a, a, a vaccine for the COVID-19, will that interact negatively with the other vaccines? So there's a lot of uh, confusion or really a lot of concerns, I would say, more than confusion, just concerns of the unknown. And I think that's having an impact on what decisions people are making today around getting vaccinated. So, so we've recently issued guidance about vaccines. Um, and the reason that's important to American people is not necessarily the details, but because what we want to do is provide clarity. What will the FDA need to see to ensure the American public that a vaccine is safe and effective? You know, Senator Scott, FDA is the world's gold standard. Yes. For safety and effectiveness in vaccines and the rest of the world looks to us. And there's a reason for that. We have amazing scientists, doctors, nurses, pharmacists who every day look at these sorts of data and help make the absolute best decisions for the American people. And what we did was we put out information, hey, this is what FDA needs to see to actually sh to demonstrate that a, a vaccine's safe and effective. So I want to uh, assure, ensure, you know, assure your viewers that we're on the job here, that we won't cut corners on this, awesome. and that we will provide guidance to everyone. Can you take this with the flu vaccine? Could your kids get it? Um, and one other thing I just wanted to emphasize is that we are very cognizant of the fact that these clinical trials that are being done for vaccines absolutely must have uh, people of, of vulnerable populations, people of color. They, that it is absolutely critical because we know that we have to be able to demonstrate across a broad uh, set of population uh, of Americans, and we want to provide that assurance to the American public. Well, Dr. Hunt, I, if I had to put my life in, in the hands of someone at the FDA, it certainly would be you. And I say that without uh, any uh, second thoughts. And I say that with a sense of confidence and boldness, because I really believe that you care about every single American. And one of the challenges that we have is when you look at the statistics around who will and who will not get the vaccines, even if we have one, we're no longer talking about vaccinating, vaccinations for your kids. We're now talking about 
what you would do if there is an actual vaccine available for COVID-19. And I saw startling numbers, to be honest with you, 49% of Americans right. say they would get vaccinated. We saw 25% of African-Americans, and I think it was 37% of Hispanics saying that they would be vaccinated. If my math works well, that means 75 out of 100 say they don't plan to. And right. Hispanics, 63 out of 100 say they won't plan to, and 51 out of 100 Americans say they don't plan to. That concerns me. Uh, Senator, it completely concerns me. And, um, you know, we need to provide confidence to American people. First of all, let's understand why someone wouldn't want to get the vaccine. Okay. Um, and and if, if that's because you have concerns that it's going to be rushed and not safe, I'm very happy to address that. One person can't do that. But by being transparent about what we need to actually ensure the safety of it, we're hoping to take the first step to convince people that when a sec vaccine is authorized by FDA, that people would be willing to take it. I think we've seen across the country what happens when we shut down, what happens um, when um, we need to take mitigation efforts um, for, for COVID-19. And so a vaccine is a critical step. It's not the only step, but it's yes. a critical step. And if we could have one that's safe and effective, um, we really need to make sure that people, particularly in vulnerable populations, understand what it's about, what the potential side effects are, and what we did to develop it and to prove it. Because that, I think, will go a long way to getting people on board. But Senator, I promise you this, you tell me when you want me to come on board with you, I will talk to whomever to, to help provide that uh, assurance to the American people. You're right. I care so much about our country and we have such great people. They've done such great work. We, we need this for them. Well, i tell you what, I, I, I love your enthusiasm and, and it's infectious without any question, but the vaccines that we're talking about are, are very important because uh, what I don't think we always see a clear picture of Dr. Hahn is that there is an unintended consequence for staying locked down. There's an unintended consequence of, of not being able to get fully re-engaged in society. And some of the numbers are startling. That They call this the, the death of despair is rising dramatically. The suicide rates are going through the roof. The, the, the number of antidepressants being prescribed are, are, are flowing too high. So th there's more than just how we deal with the actual effects of the virus. There is the larger footprint of how we deal with this overwhelming sense of isolation and what that's doing to parts of the American family. I think that's as important perhaps at times because it's covered so little that there are other things happening that could imperil the health of this nation. Senator Scott, beautifully said and absolutely true. We're seeing overdoses go up. We're seeing suicides go up. And, and you know, you're seeing it in the faces of our young people who are going out right now. Um, they, we need to get out. We need to open up. We need to do it safely, and yes. we can. Uh, one thing I know about the American people, they will do almost anything uh, to preserve their freedom, and they will do it um, in the right way. We got to get the public health message out, but you're absolutely right. Uh, and I'm a cancer doctor, you know that, Senator. Yes. And yes. if you think about the deferral and the delay of cancer treatment and cancer screening, mammograms, colonoscopies, et cetera, that's occurred, um, that's going to have an impact as well. And oh, we yeah. just cannot be in that place anymore. So a vaccine certainly is important, but the public health message about social distancing, uh, wearing masks when appropriate, um, washing hands, that's just key. So vaccines are part and parcel of that. And anything I need to do as FDA commissioner to help, um, you know, let people know what the information is about that and to give assurances about safety and efficacy, I will do, sir. Well, I appreciate that very much, Dr. Hahn. I'm in the middle of a 30-day challenge. I challenged South Carolina and, and many others uh, last week that if you, I mean, I, I say this with a little tongue in cheek, but I say it sincerely at the same time. If you want to see college football coming back to America, wear a mask. If you want your right. kids going back to school, unless you're really enjoying being homeschoolers, homeschool parents, wear a mask. I mean, there's a lot of good reasons to wear a mask. And the other thing is, if you want to protect grandmom and grandpa or your yes. parents, I mean, they're the ones we love. They're the ones most vulnerable. Wear a mask. That's exactly yeah. right.
And frankly, if you see the, the, the I see that the uh, we've obviously all watched the numbers spiking on the number of positive tests that we have. We saw the the age drops precipitously on the average age of infection. But what we haven't necessarily paid attention to is a lot of the younger people are asymptomatic. That's right. Yet they become super spreaders in a way because they are unaware until they're tested, which means that when they see their mothers or parents or grandparents, that, that, that there's this new level of vulnerability that's, that, that these older people are being exposed to because we're now testing more so we have more information. But before we were testing, they still they could have had the virus. So the importance of having that mask mitigates the spread for the parents who, who, who are looking forward to seeing their loved ones. That, that is absolutely right. And it's no fault of someone who's asymptomatic but has it. But yes. being aware of what you just said and being aware of the measures you have to take. So, for example, if you work out somewhere and didn't wear a mask, okay, well then maybe don't see grandma for a bit. But if right. you're in the same house, wear a mask. That's okay. Absolutely. Follow these very simple um, and common sense precautions. Uh, and it isn't easy. I think we all get that. This has been a really hard six months for this yes. country. But again, I have such faith in the American people. Amen. I love it. I do too. Let me ask you a question, Dr. Hunt. As we, as we approach flu season, uh, you know, there's some question about the convergence of the flu season with COVID-19. As we are looking into the future, there's a lot of things that we can do now to make that flu season better. Would you talk about, uh, I think the social protocols falls in that category. I think masks in public fall in that category. So there are some things that we can do so that when you're seeing these two uh, systems, so to speak, coming together, that we're better prepared because we've mitigated in advance, which means we'll have a safer season in the future. I think that's right. Senator, um, I'm going to call you Dr. Scott very soon. <laughs> that, that is exactly right. I mean, we know that there will be a convergence of these seasons, or at least we think there will. But yes, the same mitigation efforts um, should work for both. I mean, that would be our public health recommendation. And in fact, it, it should result in a much less severe flu season if we can follow these okay. measures. So a couple of things we're doing from a government point of view. One is FDA has in front of it a number of tests from developers which test for both flu and COVID at the same time. Oh, so really? it's easy. So come in, you have a respiratory illness, get tested for both. It's great. And of course we have a treatment for flu um, yes. potentially, and we now have treatments for a uh, COVID. So um, there's actual action that a doctor could take. Um, the, the other thing is we have really, um, the CDC has really requested a ramp up in the amount of uh, flu vaccine that can be uh, available for this season. Just thinking that, you know, maybe more people will want it this season. So um, we wanna make sure that we're covered as much as we possibly can be. I love that. Well, you uh, listen, you talked about treatments and frankly, uh, my, my, my last question of the day, two, two last questions in about two more, two more minutes. One is talk to me about the future from a vaccine perspective and give me some good news. But before we get to those two questions, my question is, when you look at treatments uh, that are available today fighting COVID-19, we hear so much bad news on, on, on the cycles of news today that we don't hear a lot of good news about the development of treatments and and other things that may help to reduce the impact within the body. Uh, can you talk about some of the treatments? And then I do have a question about does blood type matter? Yeah, so in terms of blood type, the data are preliminary, Senator, and I don't think we can make definitive conclusions, but you're right about the initial reports suggesting that's the case. CDC okay. is actually following that and collecting data. Um, okay. So we should have more information about it. The, no, the, the second um, issue is we're getting to, to treatments, and you're absolutely right. And a lot of us have spent some time over the last couple of weeks just informing the American people about where we are. And yes, we're seeing rising cases, but we're in a totally different place than we were in March and April. And um, we're, we're seeing two effects. One is, well, several effects. There's a drug called remdesivir, which in record time went through clinical trials and was shown to reduce hospitalization. So it's keeping people in the hospital less, um, hopefully keeping people out of the intensive care unit. Yes. And then there's a drug called dexamethasone, which is a very simple steroid commonly used in the country. Um, and that was shown to produce a 30, a, a very large 30% reduction in mortality from the disease. Oh, wow. 
So really remarkable and very easy, very inexpensive. Doctors can use it, you know, just like that when patients get admitted to the hospital. Um, and then we have plasma, which is where you take a donation from someone who's recovered from COVID-19 and you administer it to someone who's sick with COVID-19. Mm. Now, we don't know yet whether that's effective and we're waiting on the data, but it appears to be safe. So one thing I say is, you know, if you have someone who's sick and in the hospital, ask the doctor about plasma. Secondly, if you've had COVID, consider calling the blood banks, consider calling the Red Cross and donate because you could potentially save a life. Wow, that's great, great news. Well, uh, let's get to my last two questions then. Uh, uh, any good news on the vaccination front, on uh, what, what you're seeing happen with the vaccines? I will say that one of the things I find interesting and exciting is that many of the companies that are in the pipeline for a vaccination have basically preloaded, made tons and tons of doses so that we're not doing it on the back end. But if once you say it's okay, we have hundreds of millions of vials or doses of what will ultimately be a vaccine. That's exciting really on the way that you have charged the industry to uh, come up with a solution so that they're available in mass, uh, mass production. Well, Senator, you're absolutely right. And first of all, shout out to you, Senator, for your leadership and other Thanks. members of Congress. You made an appropriation in the first uh, Re Recovery Act or the first uh, you know, stimulus uh, package that allowed us to fund that effort. So there's, there's a government effort that's, that's funding the manufacturing. We call it at risk, meaning before we know if it works, we're funding the manufacturing of it. But then also on top of that, there is a, um, th there, there's private companies who are developing this and they're also doing this at risk. And really just great service to the American people and, the, and the, the world, frankly. So one of the ways that it's being expedited is, in fact, while we're looking at the clinical data, while we're developing it, we're actually, um, we're actually having folks manufacture the vaccine. Yeah. So that if there is an authorization or approval this fall or winter, we have vaccine to begin to be available at that time. Excellent. Now, do you think uh, fall or winter of this year, 2020, we'll, we'll hear like, late breaking great news heading into thanksgiving or christmas where a vaccine is likely to be available i know you probably don't want to guess at timelines but i'm going to pretend like you do want to guess i'm going to ask you anyways well i learned a long time ago senator as a doctor that i don't have a crystal ball but yes, what sir. i can tell you is that um i'm cautiously optimistic about the timeline i Good. think we're, we're making good progress toward that timeline of end of this year, early next year. And, and who knows, we may hear even earlier, and, and that would be great news. One thing every one of us wants is a vaccine that's safe yeah. and effective as soon as we can possibly get it. And one thing, Senator, that I want to assure the American people is that we're on the job at FDA. We'll look you at are. the data and we'll make that decision in the best interest of the American people. Amen to that. Well, let me just ask my last question then. Good news. Tell me about some good news. Um, okay. So we have an incredibly robust pipeline of therapeutics. FDA is overseeing 144 new clinical trials of wow. treatment for COVID-19. Um, and some of the most promising ones are going in the final stages of clinical development this month. So we should hear some really good news about additional therapies this fall. Awesome, that's great news, man. That's a great place to end. Uh, Dr. Hans, thank you for your energy. Thank you for your time. And Frankly, thank you for your expertise. You have blessed America when we needed to be blessed. And I look forward to talking to you real soon. If I can be helpful, I look forward to you telling Congress what we need to do to make sure that the American people are healthy and we'll uh, make sure that we get that done. Well, God Senator, God, God bless to you and to your, to your viewers. And um, it is an absolute honor and pleasure. Please invite me back. I'd love to come back. Thank you, sir. You'll do it. You're already invited. Okay. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.